Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the God Almighty, the kind, the merciful. Sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum. May God's peace be with you. We are grateful to Pastor Stanley for offering us this opportunity of discussion entitled, Is the Bible True Word of God? It is Mr. Didat's first trip to Scandinavia. Many people refer to him as Professor Didat, Dr. Didat, Alama Didat. Mr. Didat, during his lecture time, does not avail the opportunity of putting forward an apology. I therefore have to inform you that he is not a professor, he is not a doctor, and he is not an alama. He is a layman, self-taught, self-educated, Muslim scholar of the Christian Bible. He will, brothers and sisters, this evening share his experiences with you, inshallah. I would now like to hand you over to Sister Maria Nelson, who is the co-chairman of this meeting. Sister Maria Nelson. So, in the name of Jesus Christ, I also want to wish all of you welcome here tonight. I would like to present to you Mr. Stanley Sherberg. I am sure that many of you have heard of him and uh, also that perhaps many of you have seen him before. He is the pastor of a church here in Stockholm and has lived here in Stockholm for many years. But he has also lived in Muslim countries and he's well known for having helped out Muslims socially and medically. For some practical reasons, I would like to inform you now how we're going to about the session. First, we will let Mr. Adidat speak for 50 minutes. After that, Mr. Stanley Schoberg will speak for 60 minutes. After the speech of Mr. Schoberg, Mr. Adidat would come back for another 10 minutes. When the speeches are over, we will invite all those who have questions to line up. The ones who have a question for Mr. Schoberg, please line up right there on this side of the podium. For those who have questions to Mr. Adidat, please line up here. And you will be asked to come forward and pronounce your question. We ask you kindly to be as precise and as short as possible. Our time limit tonight is 9 o'clock and we cannot exceed that. So, we will soon start. I hope you all feel very welcome. <clears throat> Sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, before I hand you over to Sheikh Didat, our first speaker this evening, I would like to point out that it is a discussion and we must, in a meeting of this nature, contain our sentiments and emotions. I would now like to request Sheikh Didat, our first speaker, to please proceed.
اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم مسٹر چیئرمن این مائی ڈیئر برزن سسٹرز بیفور دی ٹائم کیپر اسٹارٹس ٹائمنگ آئی ووڈ لائک ٹو میک اے پلی اے ریکویسٹ دیٹ آئی ووڈ لائک ٹو پرسنلی تھینک پاسٹ اسٹینلی فور دی ونڈرفل گفٹ He had a sent to me to South Africa a personal tape introducing himself to me and the manner in which he speaks. Uh, if there was a facility and if there was limitless time, I would have liked you all to hear Pastor Stanley speaking to me, addressing me, with the love and the humility, tremendous humility. He won my heart. <laughs> and if humility and beautiful talk can convert a person. Uh, as soon as I arrived here in Stockholm, I would have searched him out and he said, Brother, take me and have me baptized. <laughs> But... Uh, In return, I would like to say that I would also like to present you with something, the most valuable thing that I have. And that is this holy book. We Muslims call this book the Last Testament. Of course, the pastor will challenge me. He says, look, we know about the Old Testament. We know about the New Testament. But we have not heard anything about the Last Testament. I says, no, that is what I'm here to educate people about. That if there is such a thing as an Old Testament, and if there is such a thing as a New Testament, there is also such a thing as a Last Testament. This Last Testament happens to be the Holy Quran. And I'm presenting this to pastor that maybe in this later life of his, as he goes along, that this book of God might have some chance of changing his heart. This book here is an encyclopedia. It's an encyclopedia of 2,000 pages. I do not expect him or any one of you, if you have one, they are available in the foyer outside, these books here, 2,000 pages. How are you going to have access to it? You see, to make things easy for the pastor, I am telling him, as well as you all, that at the back of this book there is an, a comprehensive index. If you browse through the index, the things that tickles you, look up those subjects. Don't try to wade through from page one to two thousand. Don't do that. We, nobody seems to have got the time to do things, exercise like that. Now in the index, what do you want to know? You want to know about God under G everything about God. You want to know about Jesus, open J, everything about Jesus. You want to know what the Quran says about the Christians, good Christians like Brother Stanley. What does the Quran say? It says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَلَا تَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَلَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارَى ذلك بأن منهم كسيسين ورهبان وأنهم لا يستكبرون. This is the nearest to you, the Muslims in faith, will thou find those who say we are Christians. This is what the Quran is saying. That the nearest to the believer to the Muslims will thou find those who say we are Christians, because among them, among the Christians, the Quran says there are men devoted to learning. Men who have renounced the world and men who are not arrogant. And the commentator, he describes this quality about the Christian, the good Christian. I'm reading from the book. It's chapter 5, verse 85. What's going on there? Verse 85, the commentary on the verse, it says, The meaning is not that they merely call themselves Christians, 
but they are such sincere Christians that they appreciate Muslim virtues. They appreciate Muslim virtues. As did the Abyssinians to whom Muslim refugees went during their persecution in Mecca. They would say, it is true, we are Christians, but we understand your point of view. And we know you are good men. The commentator of this book says, they are Muslims at heart. Those Christians are Muslims at heart, whatever the label may be. You can label yourself, I'm a Pentecostal, I'm a Roman Catholic, I'm a Jehovah's Witness, whatever label you apply. But if these are your qualities, we say you are a Muslim. With these words. This is for you. Thank you very much. Now, Chairman Saab, you can now start clocking. The subject of the debate or dialogue is the Bible really the Word of God, truly the Word of God? Now, in any dispute, any confrontation, any case, legal, criminal, theological, the first thing they do is to identify the witnesses or the exhibits. So in this case, since we are talking about the Bible, I have brought with me here some Bibles. We would like to know which Bible are we talking about? Generally people say there's only one Bible. Generally, people think there's only one Bible. But here I show you this little book here. This is the Holy Bible. It is called the Reims or the Douai version of the Roman Catholics. Brother Stanley, do you accept this as the word of God? It says the Holy Bible. Do you accept it? That's number one. Number two. I have here with me the Schofield Reference Bible. Reverend Schofield, backed by eight DDs, Doctors of Divinities, they produce this Bible. This is based on the King James Version. Are we talking about this Bible, Roman Catholic Bible, or this Protestant Bible? <laughs> this one here, I went before coming over, I bought a Swedish Bible. This is also based on the King James Version. Is this Bible we are talking about? Then I have here Siamese twins, as you see. Identical. Identical Bibles. Look at them. You can't mistake their identity. They are identical. Both say Revised Standard Version, Revised Standard Version. Out of these two, one is 1952 and one is 1971. Which one would you accept as the word of God? So we have to identify, if you can help me, he said, look, I accept the RSV, or I accept only the Swedish Bible, I only accept the King James Version, or I accept the Roman Catholic Bible, then we can proceed. Otherwise, we don't know which Bible are we talking about. Because these are all different Bibles. By God, they are not the same. Even these twins, are not the same. They may look like Siamese twins, but they are not. So if I have the privilege of knowing, it will make it easy, my task easier to proceed with the Bible which the pastor accepts as the word of God, out of all these. Which one? Sir? Yes. Which one, sir? out of these. I'll answer you when I get the time for myself because I have a very good answer. Thank you. Okay, sir. <laughs> when we open the Bible, any Bible, any one of these, the common denominator, I'm talking about the common denominators now, 
when we open this Bible, any Bible, the first verse of the Bible, Genesis 1, 1. The first book, first chapter, first verse. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The word God in the Hebrew language is Elohim. And Elohim, any Jewish scholar, pastor has contacts with Jews here, he's in good communication with them. If not tonight, tomorrow night we're having another debate somewhere closer to his diocese, his church. And we can bring this rabbi along and says, now I would like to ask the rabbi this word Elohim. Please translate. And if he's honest, any Jew who knowing Hebrew will say God's Elohim. El in Hebrew means God. Elah in Hebrew means God. Elohim means God's in the language of the Jew. But every translation without exception, the hundreds of translations the Christians have done, they have deliberately mistranslated the first word in the first sentence as God. It should be God's. Why this game? Why deceive the people? If it is God's, why do you translate it as God? First sentence, you make a mistake. Then, if this is the word of God, as the pastor told me on the tape, is that he is a fundamentalist. And I love that. He is a man, he said, I believe that between cover to cover, from one end to the other, I accept everything from cover to cover as the word of God. No change on that, no change. So it makes my task easier. He accepts everything as God's word. So he says, now this word here, what is it? It is God, you have no right to change. No person has a right to change. The word they created the heaven and the earth. Now in the fifth major revision of the King James Version, the word heaven is now changed to heavens. Where it's supposed to be God's is singular, where it is singular, made it into plural. Now, I want to know whether Christians or any scholar or bishop or pope has a right to add or to delete a word or changing the meanings. I know. The book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible says that whosoever adds or deletes anything from the word of God, plagues be added unto them. So, we would like the professor to explain, the pastor to explain who did this and who's doing this with the word of God, if it is the word of God. Then in the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, 700 times we are told that this is not the book of God, this is not the word of God. Seven hundred times you read and the Lord said unto Moses and Moses said unto the Lord the Lord said unto Moses and Moses said unto the Lord which means the Lord didn't speak these words nor did Moses write those words this is the third person. Somebody else is talking. He says, well, this is what he heard his information is. This is what God told Moses, and Moses told God. And Moses told, uh, God told Moses, and Moses told God. Seven hundred times we are told, this is not the word of God. Then this book, these five books, attributed to the holy prophet Moses. But in the last book, the book of Deuteronomy, Chapter 34, we read, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. Died is past tense. Died in English, past tense. In the land of Moab, 
according to the word of the Lord. And he, God Almighty, buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peer. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. Nobody knows where his grave is, up to today, when somebody else is writing. Moses, before he died, he couldn't have written that no man knoweth of my great grave up to today. The man is still alive. How can he say that? And Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died. When he died. Moses wrote that. That he was a hundred and twenty years old when he died. And his natural and when he died, his eyes was not dim, nor his natural forces abated. He was still strong enough, vigorous enough to marry another sixteen year old. He had those powers. Moses say that? Did he say that? That his natural powers had not abated before he died? And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Did Moses say that? So we say, no, this is not only not the word of God, it's not even the word of Moses. Somebody else is writing it on the very face of it. Any school child in the kindergarten who can understand and read this will be able to confirm and tell you this is not God's word and this is not the word of Moses. These twins that I have, twins, twins. Now, to show you that these twins are not really twins, these are not identical. There is some deception here. They are identical on the face of it. I don't know if, whether the, um, the pastor would like to cooperate. I would like him to open, if he pleases, if he will help me, otherwise I have to call somebody from the, from, from the audience. If you will help me, this book here, Isaiah chapter 37. If you'll only open Isaiah 37. No, this one here. These are twins. We want to compare the twins to see how they're deceiving the Christian world, how they produce this by the millions and deceive the ordinary people. I just want to demonstrate that, and I would like him to help me with this one, sir. This is the Holy Bible, Revised Standard Version. Just open Isaiah 37, and I'll read from here and see whether it is the same. That's all. If you will, sir. Shall I? Yes, sir. Okay. Just open it. No? Just open it. Just have a look, sir, while I'm reading. Just have a look whether I'm reading correctly. Isaiah 37. Which verse? From verse 1, sir. So we don't have to search. 37. Isaiah. Got it, sir? Verse 1. When King Hezekiah heard it, he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. Correct, sir? Yes, I'm following. Yes. yes. And went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the secretary. And the senior priest covered with sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos. Verse 3. They said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of distress, of rebuke, and of disgrace. Children have come to the birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God heard all the words of Rabakshe, uh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God. And go on to verse 8. The Rabshake returned and found the king of Assyria fighting and going on to verse 14 Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it and Hezekiah and on and on word for word the same yes but sir I'm not reading from the book of Isaiah I'm reading from the book of Kings In your time, you'll explain that. In your time, that's the greatness of the Bible. <laughs> you see, word for word, word for word, I am reading 2 Kings 19, and he's confirming in Isaiah 37. 
In other words, word for word, it is the same. And let me share with you the knowledge I have gathered from the Christian learned men. They tell me, unless the pastor says to the contrary, that the Bible was not a verbal revelation. Like we Muslims believe about the Quran. We believe that the Quran was a verbal revelation. God Almighty tells his messenger, Qul, huwa Allahu ahad. Say, he is God the one and only. So Muhammad says, Qul, huwa Allahu ahad. So Allah is Samad, God the eternal absolute. So he says, Allah is Samad. He says, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He does not beget and is not begotten. So he says, Lam yalid wa lam. It was a, the Quran is a verbal revelation. The Christians do not believe in a verbal revelation. They believe that the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, inspired people, tickled people to write. What they wrote. But in that case, you can't have word for word reproduction. If somebody tickles you to write about this meeting, you can't reproduce word for word what the other man has written, the other journalist. Your wordings will differ, your settings will differ. This is human. Even if you are inspired to write about this meeting, no two will be identical. Here, identical, which means that this was stolen. In literature, they call it plagiarism. Somebody has been plagiarizing what was written. This guy here, under his own name, he rewrites this whole thing and he says, this is mine. In literature, you call that stealing and you can be charged for stealing. Now, God doesn't do that. He doesn't dictate to one prophet and then he forgets what he has inspired and he takes the trouble of repeating word for word, phrase for phrase, comma for comma, full stop for full stop. God doesn't do that and the Holy Spirit don't do that. The professor, the pastor will explain how it comes about that there is an identical word-for-word -word reproduction from one book written hundreds of years before the other book was written. How did they do that? Let us hear this Christian young man, Hans Kuhn. Hans Kuhn. He's written a book called Infallible, question mark. Author of being Christian. He says, who is this man, Hans Kuhn? I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it correctly. Please forgive me. You know, the Scandinavian language is a bit difficult on my tongue. <laughs> the 43-year-old Swiss-born, Swiss-born professor of dogmatic and ecumenical theology and director of the Institute of Ecumenical Studies at Tübingen University in West Germany, was one of the select group of official theologians appointed during the Vatican II Council by Pope John himself. Known as the young protege of modern theology and consequently may not be interpreted. Ah, he says, now nowhere do the books, he says, nowhere do the books of the New Testament claim to have fallen directly from heaven. Nowhere. This is what our friend Hans Kuhn says. On the contrary, Often enough, they quite candidly emphasize, quite candidly, honestly, they emphasize the human origin. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, is especially revealing on the origin of the Gospels. Especially revealing. What does it say? Luke chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Luke tells us, he doesn't talk about him being tickled by the Holy Ghost or by the Holy Spirit to write his works. He says here, verse 2, Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also. If every Tom, Dick and Harry, people less educated myself than myself, if they can write volumes, me, a physician, one of the most learned, of the followers of Christianity at the time, why can't I do a better job? This is his inspiration. The others, you can do it, you can do it, why can't I? I'm more learned than you. So he says, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. The only thing he claims is that the other writings are not orderly, mine will be an orderly account. Mark. He's jumping here, there, and everywhere. Mind won't be like that. Mind will be an orderly book. That is, he does not claim to be inspired by God, or by the Holy Ghost, or by the Holy Spirit. His inspiration is the people that went before him who had done the job.
And in this book of Luke, chapter 3, verse 23, we have the genealogy of Jesus. It reads, And Jesus happened to be about 30 years of age when he began to preach. Who being in brackets, in brackets, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, in brackets. <sighs> now what's all this? Number one, if the Spirit of God is inspiring Luke to write that, the Spirit of God didn't know how old Jesus was. Can you imagine? The Spirit of God is supposed to be God. The Christian believes, the Pentecostals believe, that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. But they are not three gods, but one God. The Holy Ghost is God, the Spirit of God is God. But this God, if he inspired Luke, this God didn't know how old Jesus was. So, he is saying about 30 years. God doesn't know how old Jesus was when he began. He said, about 30? About? He's not sure. When he began to preach, now in the latest translation, the word, when he began to preach, is taken out. You know why? The question arises, God Almighty waited for billions of years before coming down to earth. And from the age, from day one to the age of 30, he didn't deliver one sentence for the benefit of mankind. What was he doing? For 30 years, what did he do? One sentence to help mankind. He did nothing. Not one word. Not one sentence. So, when he began to preach, for 30 years he did nothing, so they took the word when he began to preach, is out. Or the modern translation of the King James Version, the word is taken out. And as was supposed, are in brackets. Meaning, Luke, Luke didn't write those words. Ask any Christian scholar, any Christian scholar worth the name. These words in brackets, what do they mean? What do they imply? And they will honestly con confess that it means that in the original manuscripts, these words were not there, as was supposed was not there. These are the words of the editors, trying to help the reader. They have a right. They have a right. In the Quranic translation, we find the same. The translator, he puts words in brackets, meaning he's trying to convey to us that, look, the words are not there, but this is what is implied. He's trying to help you. This help is appreciated. In the Bible, also appreciated. But now, you see, they can mint the word of man. It's the word of man now. If Luke was inspired, then those words in brackets are not inspired. But what they have done now, in the Swedish Bible and the Danish Bible, I check them up. The words are there. As was supposed, are still there. But the brackets are thrown out. You know now what it means? Once the brackets are thrown out, it becomes the words of Luke. And if Luke was inspired, they become the word of God. So the Christians are minting God's word at their own leisure anytime. But they want to, they can put words in, put it in brackets, honest, very honest. And then take the brackets out in every translation other than in English. In the vernacular, in Zulu, Afrikaans, in Urdu, in Swedish, in Norwegian, in every language of the world, world other than English, the words are retained and the brackets thrown out. Maybe the Scandinavians don't know what brackets mean. <laughs> you see, the Quran gives us an acid test of wanting to know whether a thing is inspired by God or not. The Quran says, al Quran, do they not consider the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone other than Allah, other than God, you would have found in it many discrepancies, many contradictions. Any book claiming to be from God ought to be infallible, no contradiction. That is the claim of the Quran. The same test should apply to the Holy Bible. If it is the book of God, it should have no contradictions. So I read to you.
for the pastor, 1 Chronicles chapter 21. 1 Chronicles, book of Chronicles chapter 21. It says, and Satan, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Take a census. Who provoked David? Satan. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, it says about the same thing. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. The Lord means God, not Satan. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he, and he moved, he provoked, he inspired David against them to say, go, number Israel, go and take a census. Who did it? The Lord did it. In Chronicles, who did it? Satan did it. And I know in no religion is Satan and God are synonymous terms. No religion on earth. You say, Satan is God and God is Satan. Is it? No. One says Satan inspired the guy, and another one says God inspired the guy, which is from God. The Holy Ghost, which was inspired by the Holy Ghost. The professor will answer. 2 Kings, chapter 7. And it was an, an hand breadth thick, and the brim thereof was wrought like the brim of a cup with flowers of lilies, and it contained 2,000 baths. 2,000 tubs, baths. 2 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 5 says, And the thickness of it was, the handbreadth, same, word for word, same. And received and held 3,000 baths. One says, one book, one writer says, inspired by the Holy Ghost, that they had 2,000 baths. The other one, inspired by the same Holy Ghost, he says 3,000 baths. The difference is only 50%. <laughs> only 50%. <laughs> But I want to know which is from God and which is from the devil. Because look, both can't be from God. Uh, otherwise God didn't know. And one time he tells one fellow write 2,000. And he tells the other fellow write 3,000. Then, from the New Testament, John chapter 18 verse 9. Verse 9. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Jesus spoke. And in inverted commas, his words. Of those whom you gave me... I have lost none. None means not one. Zero. But the same John, in a chapter before, he had written, chapter 17, verse 12, he had written, while I was with them, quoting Jesus, in the world, I kept them in your name, in the name of God. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost. None. Same as the first one. None is lost. Except the son of perdition. You know who? Judas Iscariot. Excerpt 1. None but one. The first one says none. The difference between none and one, <laughs> you know, in percentage wise, I, would, I have some <laughs> few notes with me here. Five notes, ten pounds each. That's all I have got with me. I would like some lady to just tell me, the first lady, I want to give the ladies a preference, please. If you don't mind. My brothers, don't mind. Give the ladies a chance. If they can tell me what percentage is that between one and none, between zero and one, how many percent? A lady, lady, a lady who was talking there just now? I just heard that said like a man. Any lady, young lady, old lady, <laughs> little children, first preference goes to the ladies. The difference between zero and one, 50 pounds. I don't know how many corona that is. <laughs> I want to give it away, man. Please, please help me. How many percent? Hundred percent. You are not a girl. <laughs> Never mind. It is. You use the word term endless. The word actual word is infinite. 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 Infinite is the right word, but you meant that when it says endless. Infinite. Infinite percentage of difference between zero and one. Remember that. Please, let the young man come.
Very easy to answer, sir. The Holy Ghost. What did he inspire, John? One or none? What did he inspire? And whether it was from the Holy Ghost. And the same John is contradicting himself. Same John. And Solomon had, among, I'm quoting from 2 Chronicles, chapter 9, verse 25. And Solomon had, among so many things, 4,000 stalls of horses. 4,000 stables of horses. 2 Kings, chapter 4, verse 26 says, And Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses. Was it 4,000 or 40,000? This God, this Holy Spirit, what did he inspire the author of Chronicles and what did he inspire the author of Kings? 4,000 or 40,000? The difference is only 36,000. Now don't tell me this was a question of zero. You know, you add a zero and it becomes so much more. The Jews in this age, they didn't know the zero. They didn't know what they used to write it in words. They didn't know the word zero. They didn't know. They learned it from my forefathers from India. The Arabs took it and he gave it to the Western world. Zero. <laughs> 1 Samuel's contradiction. 1 Samuel chapter 28 verse 6. And when Saul, the father-in-law of David, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, inquired of the Lord, he wanted to know God to tell him, direct him. The Lord did not answer him either by dreams, or by Urim, or by the prophets. God didn't answer him. 1 Chronicles chapter 10 verse 14 says, But he, Saul, did not inquire of the Lord. Therefore he, God, killed him. One fellow says that he inquired and God didn't answer him. The other fellow says that he didn't inquire, therefore God killed him. Now these are contradictory terms. Did he or didn't he? Who inspired these authors to write contradictory statements? God, or oh, you tell me who. Then, wife and wife and concubine. I wonder whether you people know what's the difference between a wife and a concubine. You see, Solomon, the old good book says that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. You know he's feeling sorry for Solomon. So there must be a difference between wife and concubine. That's what the Christians say. You see, Hagar, Sarah, Abraham had two wives, they say. The Christian says. Sarah and Hagar. Sarah was his legitimate wife. Legal wife. Hagar was a concubine. A born woman. A slave woman. That's what the Christians say. Okay? But now Moses was inspired to write, if he was inspired. Genesis, first book of the Bible. Chapter 25, verse 1. It says... Abraham again took a wife, W-I-F-E, wife, and her name was Keturah, and her name, there's a third wife. He had Sarah, Hagar, and now Keturah. Moses is writing, if he wrote it, he said, a wife, the third wife, Keturah. But in the book of Chronicles, chapter, verse, first Chronicles, chapter 1, verse 32, it says, Now the sons born to Keturah, Abraham's concubine. Are they synonymous terms? Are they synonymous? They can't be. Because when you talk about Hagar, he says, not synonymous. And God goes out of his way to, to tell us, if he did, that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. 1,000 all together. Why doesn't he say he had 1,000 spouses? 1,000 mates? No, no, no. He's making sure that these are wives and the concubine is of a lesser degree in the Jewish society. Concubine. So now, the same God, the same Holy Spirit, he tells Moses to write that she was a wife and he tells his author, unknown author, these are unknown authors, Quranicas. Who wrote it? It says unknown. You ask the scholars of Christendom, who wrote two kings? It says unknown. Who wrote the book of it? It says unknown. I'll give you a list here. What 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, what they say about the authorships of the books of the Bible. But now, the author of Quranicas 132 says that she had a six sons, this Katura, as a concubine. So six sons, and two sons makes eight. 
one through Sarah, one through Hagar, and six to Keturah. Makes eight, easy to count. Now Paul, Saint Paul, he's inspired by the same Holy Spirit. And he writes, for it is written that Abraham had two sons. Who's inspiring him to write? The Spirit of God? Because the same Spirit inspired the authors of the Old Testament that he had two sons from Sarah and Hagar and he had six more from Keturah. That makes eight. But decades, centuries later, Paul is inspired by the same Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit forgot what he had told to Moses and the others. Now he comes and says that he had only two sons. So I want to know now who is inspiring these people. Is it the Holy Spirit or some other spirits? Then in the latest translation of the King James Version, Matthew chapter 27, 21 verse 7 says, I'm reading Matthew 21 verse 7. They brought the donkey and the cart. Donkey and the cart. Laid the clothes on them. Them. More than one. Them. On them. And set him, Jesus, on them. How can a man ride two donkeys? <laughs> huh? Can you imagine? This Jesus Christ now do, performing a circus trick, uh, acrobat, you know, they do it in the circus, riding two horses on their backs and the, both the horses are going and, you know, look, they do that in circus. This mighty messenger of God, he is doing the circus tricks, riding two donkeys at a time. Can you ride two donkeys at a time? <laughs> Unless in the circus, of course, you can be in the circus. <laughs> the same book. John chapter 1 verse 18 says, No one has seen God at any time. You accept that? I accept that. No one has seen God at any time. Exodus chapter 33 verse 20 says, But he said, You cannot see my face, God told Moses. No man can see me and live. You, you can't even look at the sun. What can you see God, the creator of all this, heavens and earth? So he says, no man can see me and live. Accept it. God is not seen at any time. No man can see God and live. You'll die, you'll perish. But in Genesis chapter 32 verse 30, God inspires Moses, supposed to be, and tells him about Jacob. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. Peniel, Peniel. For I, quoting, for I have seen God face to face. Jacob saw God face to face. But we were told that no man can see God and live. And God is not seen at any time. Now Jacob tells us that he saw God face to face and my life is preserved and I didn't die. Contradiction. Who's inspiring these words? I want to know. The pastor will explain. Yes. Yes, you yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion. Accept it. How can God confuse people? It is the work of the devil. The devil confuses people, not God. Accept it. But in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 20, verse 25, we read, Therefore, I also gave them up to statues, laws, that were not good. God gave them laws to people which were not good for them, which were not good. And judgments by which they could not live. That's a devilish thing to do. God does that. He said, I'm not the author of confusion. We believe he's not the author of confusion. But he's confusing, confusing his creation, giving them evil laws, evil, evil statutes. The work of God, and the same God is inspiring these two persons to write this. One says, look, God is not the author, and the other one says, he confused the people. I'm reading this from a Christian magazine called The Plain Truth. October 1977. It says, reading Bible stories to children can also open up all sorts of opportunities to discuss the morality of sex, an unexpurgated Bible might get an X rating. I don't know in your Scandinavian countries you have such a thing as an X rating. Not fit for children to see. X rating. 
An, exp an, an unexpurgated Bible might get an X rating from some censors. A Christian magazine writes that. Which means, as George Bernard Shaw says, this is the most dangerous book on earth. <laughs> George, he says, keep it under lock and key. Your children must not have access to it. That's what George Bernard Shaw says. I want you to go and verify it for yourself, whether that statement of George Bernard Shaw is true or not. But I give you one little sample from the so-called book of God, because it can't be the book of God. I'm reading Judges, the book of Judges, chapter 16, verse 1. Then Samson went to Gaza. You know Gaza where the trouble is taking place between the Jews and the Palestinians, Gaza and West Bank. Gaza, same Gaza. Same Gaza. Samson the Jew went to Gaza and saw a harlot, a prostitute, a whore. What do you call them here? Call girls. What do you call them? Huh? He says, no, in the English language they use beautiful words, hookers and what and what not. Huh? So he went and saw a harlot, a whore, a prostitute, there, and went in and to her, he had sex with her. Hooray. Hooray. Can you imagine, in the word of God, this guy here is, he's a hero to so many people, Bible reader, Samson, you know Samson and Delilah? You heard the story, Samson and Delilah, you see the film? I think it's going on somewhere here now, in Stockholm. Samson and Delilah. That Samson, he goes to Gaza, this I'm reading the book of God, and he saw a prostitute and he went in unto her. He had sex with her. And what punishment? No punishment. He's glorified in the book of God. So I says, now what does it serve? Dr. Vernon Jones, a psychologist of great repute, an American psychologist, he carried out experiments on a group of school children to whom certain stories were being read. And he said that these stories made certain slight but permanent changes in character. Even in the narrow classroom situation, you tell stories to children, about anything, anything. You are programming the child, the stories you tell. Anything! So whatever you feed them with, sex, rape, murder, incest, shh, you are programming the people. As soon as they get an opportunity, they go and do the thing what they have been reading. We are what we eat and we are what we read. Whatever the type of literature you read, some of the things that you can buy here, if I take them with me to South Africa, I will go to jail for two years in my country. What I can get in London, Heathrow, what I can get in Kennedy Airport in America, what I can buy from here in Stockholm. If I take it to my country, my country, the white rulers, as far as morality is concerned, pornography is concerned, they are so strict that now in this age of mine, he says, you go to jail for two years for carrying such filth. But in the book of God, it is all halal, kosher, permissible. Describing God, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 20, he's describing God. He says here, in the same day the Lord will shave with a hired razor. Lord means God, he's going to shave people with a hired razor. You know the old-fashioned old cutthroat razors, I don't know whether you see them. Old-fashioned cutthroat razors, he's going to, God is going to shave with a hired razor, with those from beyond the river, with the king of Assyria. The head, shave the head, and the hair of the leg. You know, you have this today, this modern delipitry, what you call it. You know, the hair removers. Of course, the Lord didn't know about all that. He's going to shave the head, and he's going to shave the hair of the legs. I don't know how high. How high he's going to shave. <laughs> and we'll also remove the beard. <laughs> with the razor. Is this the work of God? God does things like that. You speak about God like that? That he's going to shave people's heads and he's going to shave their legs and... <laughs> Two Samuels, chapter 22, verse 9 to 11. Smoke, 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 no smoking here. Smoke went up from his nostrils. Whose nostrils? God's nostrils. Smoke came out of his nose. I'm reading the Bible, the Holy Bible. Smoke came up from his nostrils. 
and devouring fire from his mouth like a dragon. You know, you know how the fire comes out? Like a flamethrower from God's mouth. This is talking about God. Smoke came out of his nose and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. You know, the, a lump of coals, all the pile of coals starts burning. And all the coals start burning. This is what God does. You know, like a dragon. And coals start burning. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under, under, under his feet. He rode upon a cherub. A cherub. You know what's a cherub? There's the script's little girlish angels. There are two grades of angels. Look up any dictionary. Cherub. C H E R U B. Cherub. God Almighty is riding a cherub. A young girl angel. Listen to this, sir. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew. God is flying on a cherub. No helicopters. No, no plane. He's riding little girls. And these girls, if you haven't seen one, you must go to the Vatican in Rome. You'll see this beautiful thing. By God. I went there and uh, look, no regrets. No regrets. This is a picture taken, sir, from the Vatican in the holiest of holies of the Roman Catholic Church, of Christendom. These things, if the cameras have caught, please don't reproduce this. Please. Otherwise, this tape will be banned in every Arab country in the world. Look at this. This is the cherub, picture of the cherub taken in the Holy of Holies in the Vatican. In the Vatican, there are two beautiful young things in marble, flesh-colored marble, so smooth and silky that if you ever touch it, you'll get an electric shock. And God writes these, he writes them and flies them around. Uh, I think that the Superman, Superman does a better job, you know. <laughs> I would like to give pastor an opportunity now to explain all these anomalies in the book of God. Mankind's books, as a book people write novels, romance, and science fiction, it might be a fantastic book. But when you attribute these things to God, it becomes shameful and blasphemous. That is all what we are saying. That God does not write or speak these things and these words. Wa alhamdulillahi to her. Yes. I just would have to say that also Mr. Schoberg would be allowed to have uh, five minutes of introduction and then 60 minutes of speech. Well, let me say this was, I believe, my fifth volume of the Quran. And uh, I have discovered that uh, the Quran has different kind of translations following exactly the same principle as when the Bible has been translated. I can prove that reading from this one that was translated by Abdullah Yusuf Ali and reading from this one that we bought in Lahore, Pakistan translated by Mulana Muhammad Ali. And there are different idiomatic expressions in both these different editions. Quite easy to understand. Now, it's a great privilege to have this opportunity to talk to you. And uh, I like the friendly attitude of Mr. Ahmed Didat. And... Uh, At the same time, he is very open and uh, very clear that there is a conflict between Christian belief 
and Islamic faith. Now, as an introduction, I want to tell you, my sisters and brothers, and I really mean what I say, I do believe that we are all God's family and that we must respect each other because Muslims and Christians have so much together. Abraham, Moses, Elijah, and even Jesus. And before going further, I also must say that I am a spokesman for religious freedom. You have come from certain Muslim countries as refugees to Sweden because you had to run out of countries with Islamic laws that threatened your lives. And, and now you have come to a country where we believe in the pluralistic society. Let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you that, now listen to this, listen to this, You gave Mr. D. Dot time to speak, and I demand your attention. And I want to say, in this country, we are mature enough to have different opinions. Even in this hall, political leaders have been even fighting each other, but they can eat afterwards and say we are friends even if we yes and I also want to tell you when I have been asked if Muslims should be able to build their mosques in Sweden I have in various newspapers and as I have been interviewed in the radio I have said I believe that Muslims must be able to build their mosques in Sweden. And let me tell you, and let me tell you, if racism and Nazism will arise in Europe against people with other, other color or people coming from other nations, you will have your best friends among the Bible-believing Christians. And as an introduction, I want to tell you, I have had Muslims who have come to my office and they were just to be kicked out of Sweden. The police, the government, the prime minister gave them their final word. They had to go. And we did hide them in our Christian homes. And I know one, is, one witness is there can affirm that that man that we protected, he said, I will stay as a Muslim, I will never become a Christian, but I receive your help because I am in death danger. <laughs> now, tonight we'll have a very tough discussion because I'm going to be very open and frank. And I believe that you are so mature that you can listen and let Mr. Didat give the answer. Because he has challenged me and he has given words that my Bible is not a holy book. He has said that this Bible is not worth believing. And I have been sitting here 
silently listening, and I'm a little astonished because when I have been reading the Quran, then I have seen that Muhammad, he meant that the Torah and the Injil ought to be looked upon as the message of God. Why do you criticize the Torah and the Injil if the Quran tells you to believe it? Yes. Now, I said I am astonished and uh, I wonder why is Mr. Ahmed Didat such a, such a gentle man? Why is he traveling all over the world to try fighting the Christians? Well, I think I understand. Well, I have one question, Mark. You came from India, Pakistan, a very friendly country, and you moved to South Africa, and I feel ashamed as I think of the so-called Christians in South Africa that have caused so much discrimination and oppression toward the black people in South Africa. And I'm one of those, together with a lot of Christians in this country. We have been protesting against the government of South Africa. And as a country, we have taken political actions and given all our support to the black people and the colored people of South Africa. I hope you have not become so bitter because of so-called Christians' behavior that that is the reason why you fight us. Then I apologize. I ask on behalf of the Christians, please forgive us. But on the other hand, there is a spiritual dramatic situation right now. Here in Europe, we have had 70 years of communism all around us. And in East Europe and Soviet Union, the communistic forces have been fighting against Christianity. But the Christians, they have been praying, they have been reading their Bible, and they have been faithful and finally communism was overthrown without even one bullet just by love and peace but now Islam is coming stronger and stronger all over Europe and uh, maybe this is a kind of mission activity that you have come here. Anyhow, let me come to the point. I'm going to ask all your, uh, answer all your questions and I have very good answers. But first of all, I want to tell you in which way I am convinced that the Bible is the Word of God. And my first point is that I want to explain how the Bible came into existence. It is a miracle. And it's very true that we do not believe in a verbal dictation. We believe in a complete, total inspiration. God is so great, he did not need to talk through the ears. He could talk directly into the hearts of the people. Now, the Bible is a miracle. Forty different individuals from different backgrounds during a time of 1600 years gave us this Bible and when you really look into the word into the Greek language and the Hebrew language you can't find even one contradiction because every contradiction that looks as a contradiction is just easy very easy to explain if you just give me the time now, 
how is it possible that God could allow the Bible to become as it is, not a dictation product, but this kind of, I would say, divine incarnation. Well, that's God's idea about how he wants to approach mankind. He became man, God, allowed himself to be born into this world through the miracle when Mary conceived Jesus. And that's the great idea of Christian faith, that God is not on far distance. God wants to get close to each and every one. I like one illustration to explain how the Bible came into being. Suppose we have a great composition of classical music and we want to hear that music and ask someone to play on a piano. Next, after having heard this composition in, pia in piano music, you ask someone to play on an organ or maybe a guitar or a horn orchestra. There are different instruments, but all are completely faithful unto every single note of the classical composition. It's exactly the masterpiece, but there are so many different kind of, of, of experiences of the music. This is how the Bible allows itself to be different in one way, but on the other hand, be a complete harmony. Now, Mr. Didat, he gives us an impression that there are so many contradictions and there are so many things in the Bible you can't believe. He goes against the Holy Quran and uh, he thinks that he knows better than Muhammad himself. Let me tell you, let me tell you, that no one can change anything into the Word of God, nor is it allowed to do that or take something out from the Bible, but it is impossible because within the Bible, in its original language, Hebrew and Greek, there is a system, a kind of security system in the Bible. You see, Every letter represents a number in these two unique languages. So when you read a sentence in the Bible, there is a mathematic combination behind it. And several scientists on languages have been studying this and they have found out, and this is easy to prove and give you examples about it, that the Bible consists of a mathematic genetic system. You know that our bodies are built up of a genetic code. And that's why we are born with the nose on the right place and the fingers on the right hands. Otherwise, it could be anyhow chaotic. But there is a genetic code that God gave. And from the embryo, the unseen little child that has been conceived in the mother's womb, there is a personality that has been composed by God himself. The same with the Bible. There is a mathematic combination. Every time it talks about God, there's this number seven that can be multiplied and it can be divided. And when it talks about Jesus, it's always number eight. And several other numbers, they are definitely all the way through the same. And you cannot take out one verse. You cannot bring in another sentence because the Bible is like a chain. It's a complete system. Now, our Muslim friends, 
I've been talking in the villages of Punjab. I've gone to the mosques and talked to the Malvis. कभी कभी हम बहुत गुफ्तगु करते थे जब मैं जवान था लेकिन अब मैं अपनी उर्दू बोल गया लेकिन थोड़ी सी उर्दू याद करता हूं आई बीन गोइंग टू दोज विलेजेस एंड द प्रीस दे सेड सो ऑफन यू सी द तुरा एंड द इंजील फुली राइट वर्ड द वर्ड ऑफ गॉड बट द बाइबल हैज बीन चेंज्ड बट लिसन टू दिस वी हैव मैन्युस्क्रिप्ट्स from archaeological research that has been done from the first centuries of christianity and those manuscripts are the same as muhammad mentioned when he affirmed the bible as the word of god <laughs> muhammad the prophet muhammad he was born 600 years later and the manuscripts we have from the first and second and third century have still the same words in it in this time <laughs> and there are so many many examples of great an affirmation that the bible has been proved to be fully right when it gives historical um what do you say in english now uh, all the history uh, things have been affirmed by archaeology and uh, science the prophecies have been proved to be right and there are so many examples and you know prophecies for our time If you read the last book in the New Testament you face all the warnings about air pollution and in the Bible you see that if we don't stop to pollute the air we will be burned alive and the scientists have now recognized the ozone covering around the earth and exactly what the bible has been speaking since 2000 years now is confirmed i could give you hundreds of examples now i am very excited to come as soon as possible to the questions that were given to me but i i want some of you are not acquainted with the bible you have heard so many warn you to read the bible that you have just heard stories about the bible and you know mr didat often writes in his books that when you read the bible it's just like once upon a time stories nothing to believe but you see we who know the bible we respect it as the word of god and we respect the bible <laughs> the bible is the direction to find god because many of you you believe that god exists but you have no close relationship to god but the bible will show you how to get a close relationship to god Now the Bible has a message about how God created this world but sin came into the mankind and damaged God's plan because God is not alone there is a devil on the scene We don't know when evil came up on the surface we know a little about it that from the very beginning Satan was an angel but he rebelled against god and he just wanted to damage all good that our god created then god thought how can i help mankind and here is the bible about various examples of people that tried to 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 
be free from sin and practice righteous living. Some of them succeeded, some of them failed. So God understood, no, just giving examples, that is not enough. Because truly, Abraham failed. It's real true, Solomon, he fell in dirty sin. And I'll tell you one thing, Mr. Didat. You said to us a few minutes ago that Samson had a relationship with Delilah and God did not care, God did not punish him, but then you have not been reading the Bible. Because here is the difference between the Quran and the Bible. Every time the Bible speaks about someone that commits sin, there is a judgment upon sin. But when you read the Quran, like here, my father, he is now dead. But he said, look at this. It says in the Quran, the 18th chapter and the verse 33, compel not your slave girls to prostitution when they desire to keep chaste in order to seek the frail goods of this world's life and whoever compels them to become prostitutes then surely after their compulsion Allah is forgiving and merciful when the Bible speaks about the sin of Solomon or Samson or someone else the Bible says that God is a judge and there is no forgiveness if there is not repentance. <laughs> but human mankind is not able to get rid of sin because sin is a part of our nature. It's only, it is not only outward deeds, it's a part of our sinful character. So God had to give us a better solution. And that's why Jesus came. Amen. Now, this is a problem. Tomorrow evening we'll talk more about Jesus. But let me... Let me tell you, my Muslim brothers and sisters, I understand why you have difficulties to understand and comprehend that God who is one, God is one. But how is it possible that one God have a son? How is it possible that God has a son? And how is it possible that God is manifested as the Father, as the Holy Spirit, and as the Son, Jesus Christ? Is that possible? Does it make sense? Is it very unlogical? You think so. But let me take you, give you an example. No one has seen God, but still you have seen Him. Mr. Didat said, Christians, they are crazy. They, they read in the Bible, no one has seen God, still He has manifested Himself. Now, let me ask you, how many of you, you have seen maybe Mecca, you have seen Stockholm, Gothenburg, you have been to Lahore, you have been to Tunis, how many have been on the sun? Have you been on the sun? No? Some people have gone to the moon. Have you been, have you seen the sun? In the sense of being there? No. No one can see the sun and survive. But... Have you seen the sun? Yes. Have you received the blessings of the sun? Have you felt the presence of the sun in your body of warm feelings? Yes. You see, my dear friends, God is one, but He's not one in the meaning of a singular, single individual person. You think of God as one, like you yourself limited to one body. But you see, I believe agar ek Malvi sahib Punjabi mein apne masjid mein dua karta hai, khuda sunta hai. Thik hai na? Lekin 
लेकिन अगर एक औरत अफ्रीका में चुपके से दुआ करती है खुदा सुनता है एक्सक्यूज मी स्पीकिंग और दुआ आपको मिलने से अपनी बड़ी खुशी हुई है ताकि मैं कुछ उर्दू बोलना चाहता हूं ओके लेट मी से लाइक दिस let me say like this god is a wholeness he is not just a singular single individual like one god is a wholeness because god is present in the mosque in punjab he hears from a small little cottage in africa and at the same time when they pray in the parliament house or they pray in a christian church somewhere else in soviet union or wherever god is there god is there Amen. now i agree it is difficult to understand but in one word in one way it's easier to understand that god could allow something of himself in his greatness to become man because listen modern science have now understood in the moment somewhere in arabia listen now in that very moment somewhere in arabia when there was a child conceived that was going to shake the world and his name would would uh, uh, should become the holy prophet muhammad in that very moment he was conceived as an invisible little embryo no one could see him see him no one could see on the lady that she was carrying a great prophet but in that invisible little embryo his whole personality was composed with beautiness intelligence ability of leadership in his genetic system in the same way god made that mystery reality that his greatness came into being in a woman in order to god that god should be able to understand us and on our behalf take our sin and die on the cross instead of us now here is something else from the bible it's very exciting to read the old testament If you read the book of Daniel you will find that in the ninth chapter there is a prophecy about a certain day when Messiah will be crucified he will die and that prophecy was given 483 years before it happened and it was 173 days no 173880 days later jesus was crucified on the cross i could explain that better i have a whole book about it but you see the bible talked about how jesus should come take our burden of sin and guilt die on the cross and he could represent all mankind because the bible says when god created he did it through jesus in the power of the holy spirit i remember mr didat that you have made a little fun actually i feel like blasphemy when i read your book about how you talk about the holy spirit in the moment the holy spirit came upon mary and you say dirty words 
and you make gestures in your video like a sexual relationship. But let me tell you, Mr. Didat, the expression in the New Testament about how the Holy Spirit came upon Mary is exactly the same explanation as when the Holy Spirit of God moved upon the earth just before creation. These are holy things. I have 25 more minutes and I'm afraid you get tired, but uh, I will have to take you into something very exciting now. <clears throat> you see, why? Why did God plan some kind of salvation for human mankind? Well, God wants us to live a happy life. God created us into this world because he wants the best for us. And alongside with the plan for reconciliation and forgiveness and restoration, God gave us ethical values in the Bible. And tonight I now come to the point in my message where I am afraid some of you have to mobilize character. Don't get angry because Mr. Didat has a very good answer. Now, if you buy a car or you buy a computer and then you want to start riding it, I think you are happy if someone comes to you from those who created that car and give you some explanation how to use the car. And if someone comes to you, you have just bought a new Mercedes or a Volvo. That's much better now. <laughs> Living in Sweden, okay. Now you sit there and you wonder, how will it work? Then someone comes over and say, well, I have a good idea. They talk about filling the car with petrol. That's very expensive in these days. Why not fill it with water? It's much cheaper. Then you say, you fool, you don't, not, you, you, can't, you, don't not, you don't know anything about cars. I, I want to talk with someone from Volvo. Can they explain? Yes. And then you get petrol in the car and now you start. And, and actually you wanted not to have a car, you wanted to have an airplane. But then someone tells you, let's take the car and, 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 and we drive up on a high mountain and you know it's a powerful engine and let's fly and you get high speed and from the mountain top you try flying very bad advice the one who gave you that advice does not belong to those who understand cars now Talk about women. Of course, it's not a good illustration when I think of my wife. I should not force her like a car. Keep quiet. When you read the Bible, how a man ought to treat his wife, the Bible says you should honor your wife, and if you don't pay respect to your wife, God will not listen to your prayers. The Bible says you should treat your wife as a weaker vessel because she has beautiful emotions and uh, there is something tender about the lady that may be not be true about the man. So God says be very kind to your wife. That is what the Bible says. When you read the Quran it says if your wife is not loyal to you, you correct her, try to talk to her. If she doesn't listen, don't have any relationship with her. And if she doesn't change, beat her. I don't believe in that. And con concerning the idea of flying, I feel like my father. I could not understand the Quran when it says, if you have a slave girl in your house, and she wants to keep her purity, 
She wants to fulfill the goodness in life. She's working hard. And, and Allah says, don't compel her into prostitution. But still, you have got lust to that young girl, and you make her a prostitute. And then it is written in the same very verse that you shall know before you do it that God is forgiving and merciful. I don't like that. Mr. Didat will give the answer. And another thing, you have insulted several of our prophets. And listen tonight, gentlemen and ladies, all the holy personalities in the Christian history have been challenged tonight. And I wonder, I'm not going to make a statement, I'm asking, should not the same ethical principles be the same for people in leadership as people on a lower level. If we talk about honesty, righteousness, handling money, should there be one ethical principle for the rich and another for the poor? No. But how can you believe that Muhammad as he comes into the house of his own son, an adopted son. And that day, the lady, the young lady, married to his own son, she's not covered, and he is falling in love with her, and she thinks, well, I have to be willing. And Muhammad asks Allah, and Allah says, this is wrong if others do it, but not for you. You can do it. No, don't. Now, this is a very critical hour. I have questions toward the Quran. I read in my Bible, if someone has made something, ha has done something wrong, committed adultery, committed theft, someone even killed another one because of a dramatic situation and they couldn't handle themselves and now they are sorry for it. But the Quran says, if someone has committed theft, cut off his hands. The Quran says, if you fall away from Islam, then the only punishment is that you be murdered or crucified. And uh, do I interpret the Quran in the wrong way? Well, you see, in the Islamic countries, in Pakistan, as I know, the Islamic law of today, since three months back, when Islamic laws has been restored in Pakistan, it says, if you say anything against Muhammad, you are sentenced to death. In the Bible, there is mercy upon those who make mistakes. There is forgiveness if they repent. And... Uh, Everyone is equally treated. And as I say that everyone must be equally treated, I come to the most dramatic point in my message tonight. In my hand I have a book written by Arab theologians on Jews and Israel. This book, in its third edition, has been published by the Academy of Islamic Research. Great people within Islam has written this book. And here it says, concerning the Jews, the people of Jewish blood, they were of different nature than human nature. And here it says in this book, Jews are not humans. Let's get rid of each one of them because they are not men and women like we are. Our blood is better than theirs. And my dear friends, racism is the curse upon humanity. God loves you if you are black or white, yellow or red, if you are an Arab or a Jew. Everyone 
everyone is respected on the same level. Everyone must be treated with respect. The Bible says that God's final plan for this earth is unity, reconciliation, peace in the Middle East, and a real union between Arabs and Jews and all kind of people in the world. That is what Jesus wants to bring into us. And let me say, let me say, for your own best. Now, this meeting tonight is being watched by many. We have the Swedish mass media here, and uh, you are now watched of this whole country. And I appeal to you that you understand that we are able to talk without getting angry on each other. Now, I must take those statements by Mr. Didad. I have still 15 minutes. It says in the very beginning of Genesis that God created and Mr. Ahmed Didad explains that there is a plural here in the beginning in the Bible that we have not yet discovered in our different various translations. But you see, as you read the whole chapter, you find that the plural is there. And the plural is or even in the Quran. Because when God talks about himself, he says, let us make man into our own image. So if Elohim means God in plural, this is the wholeness. As the whole Bible tells us, God is not just a single individual in the sense of human thinking. He's beyond our comprehension. comprehension, comprehension. How do you say it in English now? <laughs> Comprehension. Yes. So there is no contradiction in that. The Bible clarifies it very well in the first chapter of Genesis. And uh, let me say, we have an expert in adding to the Bible what is not there. And that expert is present here tonight. His name is Mr. Ahmed Didat. <laughs> Tomorrow evening, I'm going to give you many examples how Mr. Didat miscredit my Jesus. And sometimes <clears throat> I'm a little wondering about the honesty, but we are going to have dinner together, lunch together, and we'll talk and find out. Now, which one of your questions Take this one. Satan said to David, count the people. And in the other version it says, God said, count them. Well, if you're a father, you know the same from your children. Sometimes they say, Daddy, Mommy, I want to go to the cinema. And you say, no, don't go. And they continue to say, I want to go and see that film. But the father says, no, don't go. I'm going to cry the whole evening. No one loves me in this house. I want to go and see that film. And after having repeated that ten times, finally you say, okay, go. This is what happened. Satan tempted David to do something wrong. And David said, God, I'm going to count. God said, no. David said, no, I'm going to count them. I want to know how many they are. God said, no, you should trust on me. Don't rely upon people. You should just trust me. Don't count them because then you become proud. But David said, no, I'm going to count them. And God finally says, count them. <laughs> now, here is another example. Mr. Didat in this book has written like this, that uh, there is a contradiction 
saying that David slew the men of 700 chariots. And in the other version it says, David slew of the Syrians 7,000 men. No difficulty at all. In every chariot there were 10 men. But in one version it says, there were 40,000 horsemen. In the other one it says 40,000 footmen. No difficulty at all. All the 40,000, they, they ran. They were horsemen, but they, they, the horses were killed and they ran. <laughs> and here it says Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses. In the other version it says Solomon had 40,000 stalls. A difference of 36,000. No, no, no. You see, this is a testimony about how God was blessing. And in the beginning he had 4,000 and after some years he had 40,000. Now, Jesus said, none of them have been lost. You gained some money somewhere because uh, you uh, had an answer about how many percentage. Now, Jesus said, Judas, from the beginning, he did not belong to me. Amen. Jesus explained it. I could give you an answer on every so-called contradiction, and there is none. But, I have a few minutes more, and these, the, these are the best moments in my life. Because now, I don't want any uploads, I just want the Christians to pray. Silently pray, because now I'm going to give the best proof that Jesus is alive and is the Son of God. And what the Bible promise, it stands for. Now, we may discuss on an intellectual level, and we can even become like enemies because we misunderstand each other. And reality is difficult if there is a question of astronomy, microbiology, or any other kind of science. There are always different scholars from different directions. But life, life is something to experience. God cannot be fully understood even by a Christian, nor by a Muslim or a Buddhist. God is beyond our understanding. But it is possible to experience His love. It is possible to experience His power. And tonight, I want you to prove test and I offer you this opportunity to test if Jesus Christ is what he is the only begotten son the word begotten that you sometimes make a little fun about means in its original language the begotten son he is what he has always been that's the meaning of begotten he is what he has always been He's sitting at the right hand side of God. And because of Jesus, you can be healed from sickness. Some of you have problems in your families. You have teenagers that have gone astray and they have gone into drugs and you feel sad and I apologize because of the Swedish society that is not a Christian society and we are sorry about that but I have prayed that God will assure his love to you and give you an example that Jesus Christ is a personal reality and there will be a solution of the problem in your family and you will see a change in your teenager within the next